Hello everyone, welcome to The Net Online. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We're gonna kick things off as we always do with a short video clip that will correspond with our message today. Be sure to like and subscribe so we can give you future alerts for when we post messages and drop a comment below and thank you guys so much for joining us. And talking about fleas, the sheep dipping season has started among the mountains of North Wales. During August and September, about two million sheep and lambs will go through it. Yes, go through it, literally. It cleans the skin and kills out insects, which, if they were allowed to remain in the wool, would breed disease. The sheep are driven into pens where they wait their turn. They enjoy it just about as much as we do waiting for the dentist. The water contains a strong disinfectant, which gets right in and does in the insects, and that's putting it politely. Home, James. A good shake, a dry, and then they're off again. So let's uh, let's pray as we go into this message this morning, Lord. We. Uh, we, uh, we thank you for your presence. We're so aware that you are here among us. In our time of worship, Lord, I, I sensed you here strongly. I pray that you would have your way in our thoughts and our hearts this morning. I pray that all of us would just be receptive to your word. Lord, we look to you for that fresh anointing, the anointing that comes and breaks the yoke of bondage. Come Holy Spirit. We pray it in Jesus' name. <clears throat> so, you, most of you, I'm sure, are aware we're in a series right now called Keys to Experiencing God's Presence. We'll have one more part next week. By the way, the week after that, we're going to start a series called uh, Can You Know for Sure? And it's a very, uh, uh, very strong, very powerful apologetic series that we're going to do, and we're going to use it as an outreach to the community. So I encourage you to be thinking about people that maybe you'd potentially invite to that. Can you know for sure? A lot of people struggle with doubts. They struggle with what is the basis of our faith? What is the, you know, so uh, anyway, so today the message is titled The Sheep Dip. I love this message. Um, <clears throat> so did I just ask you, does it make you want to be a sheep watching them all get a bath like that? Getting all those bugs off? So... <laughs> So today we're going to look at how God will encounter us with his anointing power. The anointing. What is the anointing? David said, I've been anointed with fresh oil. So the idea of anointing comes with the idea of applying oil. And it's thought that it comes from this original concept of smearing oil like on sheep, you know, as a disinfectant. Maybe they mix it with other stuff, right? So it comes from a shepherd's practice. So preventing insect infestation, lice, and other insects could burrow into the sheep's ears and, and kill them. It acted like a deflector or a force field, special protection. And so when the ancients began to talk about, you know, anointing people with oil, it was coming with this idea that there's a deflection, there's a force field, there's a protection. And so it was extended from this idea of what they would do with sheep and that they would apply oil to the sheep. So I'm going to start out early today with a notable thought. The shepherd's oil becomes illustrative of God's protection and the special power that he places on an individual to do the work that only he can do through them. Did you follow that? In other words, if we're, as each individual, we're called to accomplish something for the Lord and his kingdom. And to accomplish whatever that mission or whatever that calling is, we need the anointing power of the, in the presence of the Lord to enable us to carry that out. So they would anoint priests. They would anoint kings in the ancients. 
You see it, the anointing of ministers in the New Testament. You see oil being used to apply for healing so they would anoint the sick with oil. And so we'll look at that verse in a little bit. So the Christ, when we talk about Jesus, Jesus Christ, he was known as Jesus of Nazareth. His title is Christ. So Jesus Christ is, Christ comes from, it just simply means Messiah. It means the great rescuer. But it really, in its most literal sense, means the anointed one. So the Christ is the anointed one. He is the chosen one. So the oil, the anointing oil is a symbol of the actual power of God that does the work. The act of anointing with oil is, is a symbolic action intended to release the power of God. Did y'all follow that? In other words, the oil itself is not magic. It's not like if you apply oil and there's somebody sick and you pray for them. It's not like magic that suddenly it's because of this magical oil that somehow they're, they're healed. No, that's why I wanted to carefully word that. The act of anointing with oil is a symbolic action intended to release the power of God. In other words, it's combined with faith and there's a release of the power of God when anointing with oil and obedience to God's word and there's a release of power. Interesting, First John, John is writing, he says, but you have an anointing. He's using this same idea. You have an anointing, the anointing oil from the Holy One. And all of you know the truth. And so each one of us as believers, if you're saved, you know the Lord, you walk with Him, then you have an anointing residing on you and in you, presence of God. So we have spiritual giftings. We have special abilities and graces that God gives us that are carried out by the anointing that resides with us through the power of the Spirit. So we want to walk in the anointing that God, you want, need to walk, and I need to walk on the anointing that God has placed on you. I know in my case that I have a special grace or anointing with young people. I still seem to. I still pray when I speak on a, on a Friday night, like I spoke this Friday night, there were 50-something young people there. And I, and I think to myself, um, Lord, give me favor that they'll still hear me, they'll still listen to me, that I still have a voice in this generation because God has put that in me. But don't underestimate, maybe it's something we take for granted, but the fact is I'm 65 years old. And normally in most churches, the, the way that it works is that if you're, uh, whatever age the pastor is, if the pastor is 50, then he will reach people 10 years younger and 10 years older. By and large, and that'll be his church. So if you're 50, then the church will be 40 to 50 or 40 to 60, see? So in my case, our church should be full of old people. Right? So 55 to 75. I know that those of us that are in 55 to 75 are not old people. I get that. We are not old people, right? Right, Sue? We are not old people. <laughs> so, but what are we? To the young people, we're kind of old. And so my point is that God has graced me. He's given me a grace to speak into the lives of young people. And fortunately, I can still climb a mountain, not always without injury. So I've got how many months to get ready for Big Ben this year? <laughs> My leg's feeling pretty good. I think I'll start jogging soon. It cools down a little bit. So that is, I, I'm using that in a, as an illustration of how God will give people something, a grace or an ability or an empowerment that defies the odds. I, I remember Lakewood Church Many, many years ago, I, I'm not really in touch with them now. I don't know what they're doing. I don't, I don't, I'm talking about when John Olstein pastored that church. Jeanette and I went there probably 30 years ago, 35 years ago. I don't know. It was a long time ago. And I think Kenneth Hagin was speaking and some other big names. And John Olstein was speaking. And we, we traveled to go there. And what, 
blew our minds was that where it was located, now where you see where it's located, it's a, it's a marketing miracle, you know, where they're located now in Houston. But where they were located back then, it was a hodgepodge of metal buildings that were kind of strewn about, and they'd create an auditorium, and then you could see they'd added on a section for television and all this stuff. But you had to drive miles and miles out into nowhere. And they had this church of thousands and thousands of people, but you drive for, it was really a phenomenon. I'm sitting here looking at it and I'm going, and we're driving by lots of like little country churches and things on the way there. And then you come to this thing and it's like gravel parking lot and there's like big buses and there's all kinds of people there and crowded cars. And, and, but that to me at that time was an example of a miracle of God's anointing where they were able to build a church defying all the odds. They did everything wrong from a marketing standpoint. There was an anointing that was powerful on them to accomplish what they did. Amazing. So there are anointings that God will place on individuals to carry out the mission. The anointing can seem strange. It can seem mysterious in its operation at times. I mean, you look at that example of Lakewood Church 30 years ago and where they were located, and you think, this is really strange. How did, how did, they, how did they do this? Nobody, nobody would do this. I don't know a church planter out there that would do it the way they did it and expect success. I, when, you, when we looked at Obed-Edom and his house a couple of weeks ago, and they put the ark in his house for three months, and all kinds of wonderful things happened in Obed-Edom's house after all the disaster with the ark, traveling all over the place and people bumping it around. And Remember the hot potato of God's presence that nobody, nobody knew what to do with the ark, which represented the presence of God. Sometimes the presence comes and we kind of look at it and go, I'm not sure what to do with that. And so the anointing can be mysterious. See, a lot of times people, you, you, every church will have legalists. Every religion will have legalists. And so if you're praying for somebody and, and they, you know, and they, and they, I'm trying to think of something that would be not in the Bible. Uh, uh, praying for somebody is a manifestation of power. God comes on them and in a powerful way. And maybe they, they fall on the floor and start shaking. Well, see, even that's in the Bible. Uh, I'm trying to find something, but, but there are manifestations of God's power that are not necessarily exactly precisely illustrated in the Bible. And so people will look at that and go, I want to see chapter and verse, where is that? And you have to understand the book of Acts is a blank check on the anointing power in its manifestation. The blank check is this. They refer to it over and over in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, and they called it signs and wonders. And so if God moved with a sign or he moved with a wonder, well, what's that? Well, that's a wonder. Did it make you wonder? <laughs> I mean, if it made you wonder for a moment, then it was a wonder. And then there's always people that'll, and I, listen, sometimes people can be touched by the Holy Spirit. It's the most real, authentic thing. And there's all kinds of ways that people respond to that power. I sense the power during worship. And in my, in my case, I, I just, I started to, to weep some and I began to sense the Lord's presence. I began to drink. I began to drink and soak in his presence. And in that case, that's how the Holy Spirit was manifesting his power in me at that moment. Which is real significant for me because, because I'm involved in kind of the mechanics of the meeting. So it's, it's difficult. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. It's something I have to overcome. It's just difficult. And, and actually, it's the case for our entire band. Is they can become so involved in the mechanics and being able to apply their skills and to be able to have orchestration and to be able to have a sense of flow. And all those things are a real challenge. And so coming to a place where they can lose themselves in worship is not an easy thing to do. It's easy for y'all, though. But I, but I can tell you this, that's what they want to do. Right? And it's what they're striving for. They, they're trying to usher in the presence of God. For us, they're ministers of his presence so that we all enter in. 
And we want to drink of that anointing, that mysterious, wonderful thing of the presence of God when he comes and begins to do unseen work in us. So how does the anointing come? And I'm going to look at three ways this morning, three ways the anointing comes to us. Number one, the anointing comes by association. You know, it's funny, while I'm teaching this, I sense the anointing really strong. Do y'all sense that? The reason for that is because God, the scripture says he will confirm his word by signs and wonders. So I'm not sure what, the, what our invitation is going to look like, but I can tell you this. You need to have faith this morning because I believe God is ready to liberate. So the first thing, the anointing comes by association. So example, the 70 elders of Moses, Numbers 11 says, gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them and bring them to the tent of meeting and let them take their stand there with you. So they're to stand with Moses. And I will come down and talk with you there. And I will take some of the spirit that's on you and put it on them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you so that you may not bear it yourself alone. So Moses had an anointing and enablement by the power of God to carry a certain load in leading the entire nation of Israel. And God is coming and he's saying, listen, I want to spread this out. We're going to spread this to 70 of your top men. And, we're, and I'm going to take the anointing because they can't do what's really expected of them to accomplish without the anointing. So we are going to take, the Lord is going to take the anointing, a portion, a small portion of the anointing. I don't know how you apportion the anointing, but this is what it says. So he takes the anointing on Moses and spreads it out among 70 elders. You know, associations can be really good. So these men were associated with Moses in leadership. And so because they had that association, because they were proven, the Lord chose them to distribute his anointing, his power on them. Associations can be really negative as well. Uh, Paul wrote, he said, bad company corrupts good morals. So in other words, he's saying, if you hang around the wrong people all the time, it can really drain you. Sometimes you don't have any choice. You've got to work with them. You know, well, I've got to hang out with that group for eight hours today. Well, you know, I mean, you're going to need some grace, right? But, but when it's your choice, he's saying, choose your company wisely. Choose fellowshipping with people that challenge you to be better. In the Lord and in Christ. I remember a story. It's a great illustration of anointing by association. Kenneth Hagin had a healing ministry many years ago. And he told the story. And he would travel uh, and do ministry and campaigns. And kind of uh, series of meetings in various locations. And so when he was traveling, he had a man with him who was a diabetic. And he took him with him, and during the time that he was with Kenneth Hagin for the six weeks or whatever time they were in this campaign, he needed no, he needed no insulin at all, needed no insulin. So he was receiving anointing by association. It wasn't necessarily faith on his part, but by association, he was receiving an empowerment from the Lord. And then once he disassociated with Kenneth Hagin, he had to start taking insulin again. But, it, but it's an interesting story of just the, um, the anointing on the man of God. Crystal's in children's ministry this morning, so I can pick on her. I remember a number of years ago, and I, I don't know if she's doing this now. CJ's here, isn't he? Oh, he went to youth. He's not here either. All right, so... Uh, a number of years ago, Crystal had been immersing herself in country western music. She was going to country western concerts and every opportunity. She was like, kind of like a junkie, apparently, the way she kind of told it. And she probably, she probably even, I'm figuring she probably tempered it 
when she admitted it. Probably was worse than she was coming for us. And so she realized that over a period of time that she was quenching the spirit. She was quenching the anointing. She was quenching the grace of God in her life because she was, it was sucking the spiritual life out of her. It was out of balance. Her association choices were off. I remember Colby, so I can pick on him, but I see Sarah there. So, and so now it's funny the job he has now, which y'all are going to gradually hear about. But, um, but at the time, as a relatively new believer at the time, he was just drinking talk radio and politics, talk radio and politics, talk radio and politics, kind of like I tend to do on my own. So, but you have to be careful because if you go too deep, you go down the rabbit's hole and all of a sudden you're like, you know, I need a bunker and I need, you know, you, you, you're, you're getting a loan for $30,000 for survival equipment and, you know, you're just kind of like, gee whiz, you know, the world is not looking good right now. So, so Kobe had realized, and so he took one month to listen to nothing but Christian music instead of talk radio, just to kind of break the pattern. And so he was breaking his association. And there was a one-month challenge at that time, I guess, on the Christian radio station, so it got more listeners. <laughs> you know, a lot, of times, a lot of times people will pick a church based on what they want to hear. I suppose, yeah, I, I kind of get that. I understand we would pick a church on what we want. Man, I want to hear something about, you know, this current administration, well, I will tell you, just look at my Facebook, it's all over. If you ever wonder what I think or what I believe, there's no secret to it. So, but what we need to do is pick churches on what we need to hear. Otherwise, we can be driven by the flesh. So, the second thing, that was association. The second thing is the anointing can be transferred. It can be imparted. In a way, the first example kind of illustrates that. But I want to use this illustration for this, transference and impartation. We'll look at uh, 1 Samuel 19. I only have, oh, actually, I have the whole thing up there. I didn't realize it. Maybe the print's a little small. Uh, word came to Saul, David is in Naoth and Ramah. And so he sent men to capture him. Saul was David's enemy, but he was the standing king at the time. You know that you can have people occupy office like Saul did illegitimately. They can stay there for a while, but it doesn't end well. Just FYI. Okay, so. So he. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't help myself. All right. So he sent men to capture him. So Saul, the king, the illegitimate king, sends men to capture David. But when they saw a group of prophets prophesying with Samuel standing there as their leader, the Spirit of God came on Saul's men, and they were also prophesied. Saul was told about it, and he sent more men, and they prophesied too. Saul sent men a third time, and they also prophesied. Finally, he himself left for Ramah and went to the great sister, because nobody's coming back. Keep sending teams to go get David, and they end up prophesying. The anointing comes with Samuel, who's with David and associated with David. It says, finally, he himself left and goes to Ramah. And then he says, where are Samuel and David? And they said, over in Naoth at Ramah, they said, Ramah, they said. So Saul went to Naoth at Ramah. But the Spirit of God came even on him. The enemy, Saul himself, the, the anointing came on him by association by impartation and he walked along prophesying until he came to Naoth he stripped off his garments and he too prophesied in Samuel's presence <coughs> he lay naked all that day and all that night this is why people say is Saul also among the prophets what an interesting story Like I said, the anointing can move in mysterious ways. This is a really amazing story. All right. Number three, the anointing can come to you when you put yourself in a place in which God can pour into you. You ever heard the phrase, under the spout where the glory comes out? I, I'm, I love that idea. If there's a spout and there's glory coming out, I think I'd like to be under it. 
Would you want to be under it? Oh, that's what it is, laughing. I heard somebody giggling. That's something, and people will go, people start laughing. Y'all realize in all the first grade awakening, second grade awakening, all these great awakenings, people would cry. They'd have fits of almost like agony and conviction, but they also laughed. And they'd fall out on the floor. It was one of the things that bothered Wesley and Whitfield and all those guys. Edwards, all of them were bothered by it. They wanted to suppress it in their meetings. But no matter what they did, it would just continue to happen. You say, well, I need to see chapter and verse for that one. Laughing in the church. Laughing under the Holy Spirit's power. Doesn't the scripture say, it's not saying, you know, laughing, but doesn't it talk about joy unspeakable and full of glory? Hmm. So, I, I have had the holy laughter many times. And uh, very interesting. Very, uh, there's a deliverance taking place in people. Sometimes with demons leaving people, breaking strongholds. A lot of times people are laboring under demonic oppression and they don't know it. I remember one time I had an evangelist come to my church in another life and he started getting that prophetic thing and he starts going around and he kind of, he, and so he saw a lady sitting there and he says, I got a word for you. And he went to lay hands on her and all of a sudden she starts screaming. So she's getting liberated. I mean, literally, she was being liberated from all who knows what. So putting ourselves in a place which God can pour into us under the spout. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Yahweh Rohi. Jehovah Rohi, the Lord is my shepherd. And he says, you anoint my head with oil. And of course, Psalms 23 is talking about the shepherd's song. And so as David is singing this song, he's talking about how the Lord, as a shepherd who anoints sheep with oil to disinfect them, he's saying, the Lord anoints me with oil. Why? Because maybe, perhaps, David needs some disinfecting. Sometimes I need disinfecting. Do you ever need disinfecting? In a spiritual sense where we need relief? So there's places of prayer, there's places of meditation, reading of the scripture, regular corporate worship, corporate prayer. All these things are opportunities where the Lord moves. Drinking of his presence, consistency, hearing the word and participating in worship. All these are part of having putting ourselves in a place where we are receptive and receiving and allowing the Lord to work in our hearts. We need to experience the refreshing in God's presence. We need to experience a fresh anointing. And remember last week I used the illustration of going to the movie theater and how you go through a whole process. Well, last week we looked for the gate. There's a process to entering the gate. We offer God a welcome mat. So here's the thing. Sometimes we become oppressed. We aren't seeing things clearly. You may feel like in your life you're kind of like tread, treading water, just trying to survive. I'm just trying to get by. We may have experienced some real, real serious setbacks and disappointments in our life. It can come to a point where things are really getting to us. You ever been there? I've been there, but things are really getting to you. Fear, defeat, discouragement, depression. And of course, right now in our country, our country is living under an oppression. You realize that. Fear and anxiety. And then the concerns for, of, of the rise of tyranny and authoritarian governments. And all these things are, are something that can cause great distress to people. People facing job situations where they're, they're being forced or they'll lose their job to take a, a vaccine. And so, so this causes people great distress. 
And so we have this within our culture, permeating our culture today. And I, I'm telling you right now, it's getting to some people. And it may be getting to some of us where we begin to think, we begin to kind of get so immersed in the fear and the anxiety of it all that we aren't thinking clearly. And we're going back to loan, borrow money for that big bunker we were talking about. I'm just going to go find a place in the mountains. But what if you didn't do well in the stock market? Then where do you go? More anxiety. I'm going to tell you a story. <clears throat> in my church in another life, we went through a, a really, for me, it's an extremely painful church split. It's the only really church split I've ever experienced where a third of our church walked out within a week. And... Uh, so I, it took me a long time. This is 1987. It was a long time ago. But it took me a long time to recover from that. Um, the discouragement, the difficulties that went with that, the sense of failure on my part, you know, the, the, the degree of pain, the types of things people would say, the cruelty and the ugliness that people can have. It's unfair in their assessment of what's actually happening. And uh, I, I mean, I, it's hard to even express to the, the, the extent. Now, I've had similar things happen in my life that were, were really painful. But this is the part I wanted to tell you. I stuck with it because I felt like the Lord didn't give me a release. I wasn't able. I wasn't allowed to quit. I looked for ways to quit. I tried to merge with another church. I, I did proactive things to try to figure out how I could get out from under having to be a pastor. And so then during that time, our church went into decline. Now, I can, I can tell you what turned to me. We began to participate in a series of meetings for probably two years where the Spirit was coming so strongly. And some of it honestly was, you know, I look back on it at times, I thought, we must be crazy. But all I know is the anointing of God would come and there was many hours I've spent on the floor and many, many times people were praying over me and laying hands on me. And I, I don't know how long it lasted. And I know, I know our own church had this move of God come into our church and our meetings were lasting four and five hours long on Sunday. I'm not expecting that today. I've never tried to remanufacture something that God did in the past. You follow? It's a new season, a new day. But in that day... When our church had been reduced and had been whittled down, and I thought to myself, when God came in that first meeting, and I thought, well, our church is finally starting to grow a little bit. We have visitors coming, and we're getting a little strength, and the Spirit came on that day, and children, this is how it happened. It was amazing. Children sitting in their seats, and they start falling out of their chairs. I mean, no manipulation, no orchestration, no nothing. And guess what? All those families that were there that were new and were visiting, they never came back. We want nothing to do with this. This is, this is out of, and, it was, and, I, and I just laughed because I thought, Lord, finally they're leaving and it has nothing to do with me. <laughs> it was very refreshing. <laughs> I know. So, so, the adults were watching this helplessly. I mean, their kids were falling out of their chairs. I mean, small children, like four years old, five years old, six, seven years old, falling out of their chairs. It was a sovereign move of God. I had nothing to do with it. There's no manipulation, nothing to try to get them to, to receive or respond a certain way. It was a sign. Remember what I said earlier about the anointing, signs and wonders. That was a sign and it made people wonder. So, well, I don't know what that is in the biblical. It's under the category of signs and wonders. Y'all getting that? So, now I had a few parents that went, oh, I didn't tell you. The kids, when they first fell on the floor, they were just crying. They were all crying. It's like, it's like they're all being spanked. Like, what is happening? 
And then after that, well, it went on a while, and then after that, they started laughing. All of them, all over the room, on the floor, laughing. And so, and so there's a point here where it's almost like that God is going, do you want in? Do you want to go swimming? <laughs> yeah, I know. And some of the adults said yes, and the few, and the others left, never came back. Can't remember who they were, their names or anything, but right when our church was starting to grow, and I said, well, obviously this is not going to be a growing season for us. But you know what it was? It was a refreshing season for me. It was somehow an abandonment took place in my life and in my heart where God could reach in deep into that hurt, the devastation I felt, the rejection I felt over the split that we'd had in our church and began to heal me, set my feet back, and I began to realize he's, he's not done with me yet. I think we have work to do. And soon after that, we became a part of another ministry briefly, and then we, uh, the Lord called us at that time, almost 20 years ago, specifically to young adults. And so I still have the anointing for young adults. See, the anointing. Everybody say the anointing. Now that may lift one day. I don't know, how old can I be and still get away with this? But I've decided now, it, if it was just on age, then I'd already given it up. So that's the story I wanted to give you of the anointing bringing healing and liberation. Um, I'm going to read an uh, excerpt from a book, a book called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23 by Philip Keller. It says, Sheep are especially troubled by the nose fly or nasal fly, as it is sometimes called. These little flies buzz about the sheep's head, attempting to deposit their eggs on the damp mucus membranes of the sheep's nose. If they are successful, the eggs will catch in a few days, hatch in a few days to form a small, slender, worm-like larva. They work their way up the nasal passages. Aren't you glad people don't get this? They work their way up the nasal passages into the sheep's head. They burrow into the flesh, and they're set up in intense irritation accompanied by severe inflammation. Sounds like they need ivermectin. Okay, so <clears throat> for relief from the, this is, I think I have a quote here. Uh, for relief from this agonizing annoyance, sheep will deliberately beat their heads against the trees, rocks, posts, or brush. They will rub them in the soil, thrash around against woody growth. In extreme cases of an intense infestation, a sheep may even kill itself. So what does the shepherd do? At the first sign of flies among the flock, he will apply an antidote to their heads. I always prefer to use a homemade remedy composed of in seed oil, sulfur, and tar. By the way, that's not what we're using this morning. Which was smeared over the sheep's nose and head as a protection against nose flies with an incredible transformation this would make. Once the oil had been applied to the sheep's head, there was an immediate change in behavior. The sheep would start to feed quietly again, then soon lie down in peaceful contentment. So I had a I was leading some ministry uh, in a church I was a part of many years ago, an altar ministry. I mean, lots of people at the altar. And, uh, and I started just proclaiming liberation and deliverance over, you know, many people that were kind of in the group, right? And afterward, a young mom, I think she had three or four kids, and she was overwhelmed with her life. She was deeply distressed. Her husband was a military officer in the Navy. And um, they told me, like two weeks later, kind of pulled me aside and I said, we want you to know that since that altar ministry day, she said, she's a different person. And she said, I'm a different person. In other words, she was laboring under a, a demonic oppression and she did not know it. And it was altering her entire attitude toward life, her family, her marriage, her children, everything. And when that thing was broken, all of a sudden, she was free. She began to see more clearly and began to sense. And that was the anointing that did that. We could have put her in counseling. That might have done some good. I mean, counseling can be very helpful to a lot of people. 
But what I'm telling you is that what counseling may have done for her in weeks, the anointing did in seconds. And that's why we need to understand the anointing. That's why we need to understand what the power of God can do if we'll allow him and we'll have faith in approaching him that way. Isaiah said, I shall come to pass in that day that his, it's referring to this Assyrian's bondage over Israel, that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. How is the anointing oil going to break the yoke of bondage from the nation of Assyria? And so many believe that this is actually pointing the anointing oil for the anointing will break the yoke is to a future day in which an anointed one will come and deliver Israel. And we know that mysterious individual is Messiah. James chapter 5 says, verse 13, Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up, and if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Well, one of the things I want you to catch in simplicity with that verse is that it's a verse of wholeness. He's saying you'll be forgiven, you'll be healed, you'll be... In other words, forgiven, that's not physical healing. So what he's talking about here is something more comprehensive. That we struggle, we are under, we're laboring, or we're sick, or we have, but God has a plan of healing that really deals with the entire person, the individual. So, with that, I'd like our band to come. I'd like our band to come. I've also allowed a little time today because I want us to have a ministry time. And, um, can we stand together, please? And uh, I'm going to need some oil. What's the oil with the tar in it? Uh, you know, it's funny. I don't even see the oil. It's hiding somewhere there. Okay. See if you can dig up two bottles. Okay, good. Oh, I got the big one. Oh, we got the... Oh, oh, oh. This, is the, this is the one that's got the ivermectin in it. I was kidding. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> what I'd like us to do, they're going to start playing, but what I'd like us to do is um, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. And I, I want to encourage you this morning that, that uh, if this message was resonating with you and you sense, I need something broken. I'm laboring under something that I recognize this morning it's become clear that it's not from God. Perhaps you're just dry and tired and weary. Maybe things are kind of getting to you. Maybe you're just overwhelmed. Maybe life is just throwing some curveballs that have been pretty tough. And so I want to encourage you to, uh, to just come to the altar. And, uh, and, I, and I want Margaret and Randy to... Uh, Randy... Oh, there they are. They're ready. Okay. And Jeanette. So I want the four of us to work on praying with everybody <clears throat> this morning. That's why I need multiple bottles of oil. Uh, hmm. How about the, the uh, Jesus breaks every... Uh, song I have requested. Is that what you've got? That's what you're doing? Oh, good. Let's do that. While they're singing this song, just begin to respond and come down here and let's look. Look for the Lord. I'm looking for the Lord to meet you because I have nothing. I, I need Him. Just like you do. And, um, and the oil's not magic. We know that. But it's a symbolic action. It releases the power of God. So if you would, while we're singing the song, just begin to fill this, this area here, and then we're going to have a ministry time.
of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain. Yes, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, Jesus. Sacrifice freely given such a price for our declare the kingdom of God has come. Thank you, Jesus. The government of God, the reign and rule of God is here among us. We proclaim liberty right now. Liberty. Liberty to God's people. We say and declare right now enough enough thank you Jesus <clears throat> Lord thank you for the name of Jesus first we want to come against just the overarching oppression and darkness that we all sense in our country right now Lord, we don't want to be desensitized or insensitive to what's happening. We, we're deeply concerned. But we also don't want to be run down by it. So God, tonight, this morning, we come against just the fear and anxiety that's so prevalent among people today. In the name of Jesus, we proclaim liberty to God's people. Release God's people enough. We are not of this world. We are under a different heading. We're under a different jurisdiction. We're under a different government. A righteous and good government. So first I just want to speak release from the general oppression. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Somehow, I, I want to make sure that we actually anoint everybody with oil. And, and uh, Margaret and Randy, if y'all step up here. And Jeanette, if you step up here. 
And I'm going to make some proclamations. I'm trying to listen to the Lord. Um, y'all share that. Uh, trying to listen to the Lord. I, I just... First, you want to come against fear. If fear has been a driving force in your life, let's let it go right now. Fear is so powerful and so detrimental. Fear and anxiety right now release God's people. Release God's people right now in Jesus' name. We come against lying voices. Okay, that's, a, that's, that's by the Spirit. Lying voices. Listen, during that message, the Lord was showing some of you, I've been listening to a lie. I've been listening to something that's not true. I've been listening to lying voices. Now listen, the enemy will come along and he just starts, he gets a foothold and he will just relentlessly beat, beat you up with a lie. So if, if you think that you've been kind of getting beaten up by a lying voice, just lift your hand real quick. Okay? All right, we're going to let that go right now. The scripture says, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. those thoughts that are lofty and raised up against the knowledge of God we take them captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ so say this with me everybody you know y'all are raising a lot of you raise your hands just say in the name of Jesus Christ I take authority over every lie I see it for what it is it's evident to me it's clear to me and I'm taking authority over it I reject the lying voice In Jesus' name, release God's people right now. Let them go. No more lies. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, Lord, thank you, God. All the lies. Lots of lies, God. Guys, we have just an entire culture that doesn't even know what's true and what isn't. You don't think that Slewfoot has turned loose in our country, the lying spirit. It's not surprising that we're dealing with that. Lord, we thank you for the refreshing spirit. Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. God, we embrace the spirit of truth. God, forgive us, cleanse us where we have been listening to to some false things and these lies. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just ask, just ask the Lord for a fresh infilling the spirit of truth. Say, Holy Spirit, come. Fill me today your spirit. Lord, I just, y'all say these things out loud. Lord, I thank you. The anointing breaks the yoke of bondage. And I embrace the anointing. I embrace your spirit. I embrace the spirit of truth. With all my heart, I want to live for you. I want to represent you well. Use me as you fill me. May I, may I accept and receive the anointing to do what you've called me to do. Anoint me afresh today. The mission you've called me to. Every single person responding this morning, you all have a mission. You all have something that God wants you to accomplish. And you need the anointing to do that. Holy Spirit, come with that anointing. That fresh anointing. So I, I want us to take, uh, Jeanette and I are going to move, we're going to start on the, well, with the y'all's right hand side, and, and Margaret, Randy, if y'all just stay as a team, and just start on this side, just begin to anoint everybody with oil, and if you feel the need to say something, uh, don't get too involved, there's, there's probably 50 people, so we need to watch our time, but you know, if you feel the word, just share that, okay, and uh, let's see where that goes, thank you Jesus, so whatever y'all, 